morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this week's Weekly Energy Boost. My name is Ali Sheva, and I'm here this lovely Sunday morning with David. David is back from his globe trotting and with us again in the studio. And today we are talking about creating. This is a topic that we invite David to cough at the intro of every episode. <laughs> Just in case you are curious who's our guest today. It's no guest, it's David. Um, we're, we're talking about creation today for a number of reasons. And if you're new to Weekly Energy Boost, the podcast is a seven day spiritual weather forecast, spiritual energy prediction in which we share with our listeners the most practical and powerful tools to navigate the coming week. Inside that conversation unfolds practical and powerful wisdom and tools for any day of the year, any week of the year. And this week specifically on the Kabbalistic calendar, we have two, two influencing energies. We've been talking these past few weeks about the powerful, uh, we use this word a little bit too much, but opportunities that fill the month of Libra that we are currently in and we are now on the other side so the the moon is waning we're in the second half of the month and the energy that opens up for us tonight for the next few days and then uh, in a way like um, like a seashell like a spiral expands and expands on an even more powerful level to give us the opportunity to create the year we want. Really, this is when the installation of the software happens of all of the effort that we've been making for the last six, seven weeks. So what's interesting for me about that, and I like, I didn't plan on it, but that spiral uh, visual of, let's say a, a snail shell or a seashell is really what's happening this week. We talked last week about creating surrounding light, expanding our potential, being more um, more connected to what's what hasn't happened than what has happened, being more uh, less attached to who we are, what we've done, what we've accomplished, and more to the expansive, unlimited potential that lays in lies in front of us. This week, we're really connecting to the download of those essential elements of what we want to create this year. And the end of the week, as we manifest the energy of the week, we're beginning a new cycle of the biblical readings that we do every year. That's one of the ways that we understand David and I as we prepare for every week's episode, we're looking at the Kabbalistic calendar and the biblical portion that corresponds to every week, which is really one of the main tools. Uh, I, I, it's really a compass. It's really, it tells us every week what to prepare for, what gifts are available for us, how we're going to be potentially tested. And this week is really, the, it's the creation story. It's our Genesis story. And so as we wind down towards the end of the week, we're going to see more of those. In a way, the universe is asking us, what do you really want? And what are you, what are you willing to do to make it happen? And so we want to talk this week about what it means to create, how to, we hear these stories, we're inspired by these stories about people who went from nothing to manifesting their dreams. Uh, it, just sometimes you hear about people who had a job in one, one uh, field and then left it all behind to fulfill their dream of becoming something completely different. You hear stories about people who were alone that turn around 365 year, days later, they're in a relationship, they're starting their family. We want to we wanna not only talk about what it means in the day to day of creating the life that we want, but to create also those drastic changes, to know that it's possible and to focus on what's possible rather than what's impossible. The What you said, creating the life that we want is... Usually it takes people a lifetime to realize this next thing that we're going to share, which is the life that we want is not going to be satiated by anything from the outside. And we see this all the time that we feel that there's this monkey on our back that's prompting us constantly to chase after something. 
to chase after a relationship, to chase after a career opportunity or some kind of financial status, or there's certain things that we crave to own and to buy. So we're motivating ourselves and pushing ourselves to achieve those things, only to realize after we've achieved them, then, we, then we're the ones telling everybody, well, no, those things don't really matter. But that doesn't change the fact that people have a hunger to go and achieve those things. When, when, when someone's asking, how do I achieve peace of mind and to feel fulfillment and to feel the light of the creator? All of this happens by you unlocking something inside your mind. What, what, what do drugs do? What does morphine do? It, it's not adding something to your body. It's in some way, in a spiritual way, it's telling your brain to do something that it already knows how to do. But we just don't know how to do it. And where we should be investing our desire, our time and our energy, but our desire is the source of that, is how do I unlock my happiness and my fulfillment first inside my mind and internally? And then secondary to that is all the things I physically do in this world and I'm trying to obtain and all the things I should be enjoying because the way that the Kabbalists look at obtaining physical pleasures are that I'm not obtaining them so that I can feel good about myself or prove to myself that I have this ability. Because a lot of times people are chasing stuff because they're trying to prove something, trying to overcome some kind of personal insecurity, either uh, for themselves or for others. But the reason why we are supposed to connect to beautiful physical things in this world, according to the Kabbalists, is to reveal their energy. So it's more about for the sake of sharing, for the sake of revelation, not for the sake of I need to feed some neediness inside of me. And that's a mindset that we need to shift because the more you try to run after something to feed your lack, the more you push it away. The more you try to <clears throat> achieve a certain status or financial wherewithal or the relationship because there's a part of you that is lacking and it's empty, that is broken, that needs to be healed. And so I think that the obtaining of that thing will then heal me. This is what's actually causing it to move away from you. And it's taking longer. So we have to achieve this healing inside of ourselves first and inside of our mind. And it starts with knowing that that's what we need to do. And then number two, desiring it. This is where I think Kabbalah gets very controversial. <laughs> With people, we talk in Kabbalah about becoming like God, beca that, that our purpose is to be the creator of our own reality, to be partners in creation with God. And I think if you would poll most people, they would say, I even, I, by the way, I even hear Kabbalah students talking like this, but I think most people perceive you know, God has certain wants and needs for us, desires for us, is hoping that we'll make the right decisions, is hoping that we'll go in the right direction. And if we don't get what we want, it's because God doesn't want that for us. And this is a great week to change our perception of the role in our lives of the creator and our role in our lives as the creator, right? In, in the wisdom of Kabbalah, we learn that there is only physicality. Materialism only exists in our realm. And our realm is only one tenth of the picture. Our physical reality is one tenth of what exists in the cosmos. The other 90%, some Kabbalists even say 99%, because in our physical reality, most of our physical reality is spiritual, is intangible, is metaphysical. And only 1% of our little sphere is actually physical. And this is something that science concurs with, has, has finally uncovered. And so when we talk about creating our reality, and this has been the theme for the, so many of the last few episodes, the idea of manifestation, of how do we draw the energy that we desire, we want, it's really up to us to create the vessel in our physical reality, meaning create the desire, create the 
vacuum, the force in which we can draw blessings into this physical reality. That's actually one of the unique gifts given to the human kingdom is to be the bridge between the spiritual worlds and the physical world. We are the only beings who can draw energy, draw spiritual light from the upper worlds into the lower worlds. So what that means is that what I have in my life is not God's will. It's not because God likes me or even because I behaved well in a previous lifetime, therefore I get blessings or because I behaved badly in a previous lifetime, I don't get the blessings I'm, I desire, but rather the act of craving ridiculously and then also detaching ridiculously expressing my my desires not only for myself alone but actually for the sake of sharing not me what does that mean it's not i need a million dollars because i have a million dollars of bills to pay off it's i need the creator to the universe th to support me because without that support i cannot be the being the creator I need to be. I can't I can't be the being of sharing I need to be if I am not supported strongly and fiercely in this world. So part of our work this week is to realign our desires with the universe, with the system. We if if you are asking for something, if you want to create something in your life because it's your dream because you've always envisioned yourself to have that or to be that, why should the universe support you? Take your desires this week and expand them by using them, by intending them for the sake of sharing so that you can add value, so that you can be there or do for others, so that you can have positive influence in the world. Otherwise, why should the universe give it to you? If you're gonna use it for the self alone, think about it like this. If you had a bushel of apples, who would you give the apples to? The person who holds the record in eating the most apples in one sitting or the person who, who produces apple products for their community? I, maybe I shouldn't have used the word apple, but I hope, hope you understand what I'm saying. As, as a manager of your orchard, do you want to give... <laughs> this is like 250 years ago. Right. But it's, it's something that no matter where you are in the world, it's a metaphor you can relate to. You have the apple orchard. Do you want to give the apples to somebody who's going to consume them on their own selfishly by themselves and be satiated by that? Or do you want to give it to some give give your apples to the people who are going to use those apples for the sake of sharing? And if you are not in alignment with the second option, that's okay too. Because this is the week that we can change that. Wait, wait, what are you trying to tell? Because I, I know the power of what you're saying, but I wanna, I wanna challenge it so that you could say it in a way that is even more practical for us. What are you, what are you asking of us practically? Okay, let's say you're out there and you're single. Okay. You want your soulmate. Maybe you don't even want your soulmate, you just want a partner. You've been, been, been alone long enough that you're just, whatever comes, you won't be too picky. First of all, it's okay to be a little picky as long as you're picky for the right reasons and picky, picky on the right things. But let's say you're, you're out there in the market looking for the right partner. Why do you want a partner? Do you want that partner because you're lonely or you're tired of being alone or you're tired of your family nagging you? Why don't you have somebody yet? Are you worried about your biological clock are you hoping that you're not the last person in your family's lineage? Are you thinking, well, I all your friends are already coupled, so you better get coupled too, so you can hang out with them and you won't feel bad for them? And I, I'm, I'm using, you know, maybe this is sad or not sad, but sort of limited reasons why one might want to be in a partnership. But the the point is that if you want that partnership. Think also about how having that partnership is gonna make the world a better place. Not just how it's gonna make you 
feel better or fulfill the lacks that you're experiencing uh, is, right this now. This is still too. This is too. Okay, so too, take it, David. No, That's no, this is still too people, spiritual for me. Uh, people are not here for the the I, I examination the you're doing on me. No, I I, I like it. I want to challenge it. I want to challenge it because I know what you're. I know what you're getting at, but I think also the challenging of it is what's going to make this go even deeper. Okay, so too spiritual. No one's going on a date saying, okay. You know what? Forget about the fact that I'm alone, needy. I want to have children. My clock is ticking. I feel like I'm getting uglier, older. No one wants to be friends with me. No one spend time with me. I'm, I, yeah, I want to go out on this date because I want to make the world a better place. All right, now let's go out on the date. And now I'm spiritual. And I'm totally protected because I thought about that. I, I, I can't buy I, that. I for can't the record, buy that. that's I how buy- I dated. Okay, <laughs> that's how I went on dates I, I for the world. For for all of us, like. For all of us, lower consciousness people, I cannot imagine. I mean, it sounds like, okay, I'll do that, but, you know, what do I really want? I really I really want what I want. Okay. No, but I'm challenging it. Give, give me more. Well, when you say that's what you did, tell me more a little bit about what you did. Well. <clears throat> Let us relate to your process. My process is really not typical. You're talking not about your first marriage, your second. Uh, well, I could say about both. Okay. Honestly, there was a, um, you know, I learned in my Kabbalah studies that being with the right person, the, the better the match you are with. And, you know, in Kabbalah, we actually have an episode coming up about soulmates, so I don't want to give it away completely. But I'm sure they can hear it twice. <laughs> I'm sure most people don't get it the first time. <laughs> we feel like broken records, but mm. it's it's not. It's not We're a, really telling you the same thing every week, just every calling it something week. different. <laughs> um, so let go and have certainty. <laughs> that's pretty much and you the didn't topic. even hear last week's episode, and that's oh, all that we what said. it was? That's yeah. what it was, right? Let go. <laughs> just let it go. So I learned in my fledgling Kabbalah classes that a, a really, first of all, we don't only have one soulmate, and the more upgraded your soulmate relationship, the more elevated, if you get the, the best one for you, that's going to help get the world to an end to pain and suffering. So for me... I don't think anybody's thinking about that, but that, okay, that's true. No, I, that's true. That's I, good. You're right. I, I think really... I, I thought to myself... They don't teach us that in high school. They do not teach us that in high school. And I also... I was young. How old? 18. You were 18 when... When I had this attitude. I attitude. met my... You met your first husband? At 19, and I got wow. married at 20. Wow. Yeah. That's not that's in why my you biography. have all these. That's why you have these stories from two, three hundred years ago. Yes, exactly. Because like... I've lived so many lifetimes already in this one. <laughs> the lifetime before you got married at thirteen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I stayed married till I was eighty. So I, I made inroads <laughs> this time. I made inroads this time. So I really I looked at like every prayer, every meditation, every act of sharing as though this is the one that could tip the scales. Mm to bring that person into my life. So you didn't really consider your own feelings and emotions. <laughs> no, no, I want to understand. I want, people want to no, hear I, this I stuff. No, I didn't. I didn't. Because I, people don't know that you and you more than me, but both of us were kind of raised in a different type of a spiritual environment where, where I thank God for it, by the way, because we learned in a different way and different priorities were impressed upon us that we carry on until today. Uh, but I think people need a little bit of that context. Okay, so David is correct that we, we really, we were inspired to live our lives in a very higher purpose way, higher purpose way. Exactly. So So it's not that we didn't consider our own emotions and feelings, but how would you say that? Like, it was sort of like this spiritual ninja course where you had to sort of suspend belief. You know how sometimes you see it, what is it? Um, Crouching tiger, hidden dragon. Is that yes, what it's called? Yes, yes, yes. So where it's like suddenly they're defying gravity. Yes. The gravity we defied was not physical gravity, but rather our selfish needs. And even if we suspended it for a minute, and this is now as talk, me talking to mm, whoever's listening, even if you suspend it for a second, which is really all we do, yep. right? Because the moment we let go, then we start already with the expectation of, wow, I let go. I can't wait to see what's going to happen to me. And that's true. Right? And that's true. And, and, and that's, that's as simple as it is. We were told, don't think about yourself. Don't give too much credence to your own emotions and feelings. Take care of other people. Take care of your own negativity when it comes up. And you'll be provided everything you need. As simple as that sounds, you do need an environment of people who are also doing that with you so that you can feel secure about it. And that's what we had. And that's what worked. 
And and that's essentially going back to what we talked about last week. That's why I think for many of us, our processes weren't logical, right? It wasn't like uh, we dated for five years, then we moved in together, <laughs> then we bought a place, <laughs> then we, you know, it was really accelerated because we we condensed time and space with the condensation of our selfishness or oh. our need for that instant gratification. So you got married at 20. So I think we have a lot of people who... Who are like, who, why? No, no, no. I think we have a lot of people <laughs> who have been in relationships that maybe didn't work out, divorced now or separated, whatever it is. So I think it's very helpful. You're married at 20. How, how many years were you married? I was married eight years. Eight years. Okay. And so, so why did it end? It became clear at a certain point that we wanted different things. We wanted the same things when we got married, but as two people grow and elevate individually and even as a couple, those wants and desires can diverge. It's interesting because there's always there's a lot has been said about like that seven year mark where a lot of times people, that's, that's where a lot of times people do diverge. Mm -hmm. And it's not a negative thing, but it's whatever your souls have achieved together that they needed to achieve. And I think a lot of times people have a lot of guilt, shame, or I made a mistake or whatever. And they justify by saying I got beautiful kids, so it must not have been that bad. <laughs> but let, even if you didn't have kids, I think the point is to what you said is we have many soulmates. We have relationships that must be in our lives in order to elevate us to a certain place of consciousness. And the fact that it ends, even if it ends in divorce or abuse or anything, the fact that it just ends, it's not a bad thing. Right. Well, I, the way that I... I People carry it around like a I've scarlet letter. I've distilled it like this. Just because a relationship ends doesn't mean it failed. That, that's right. And I, don't think, I think it's also safe to take it to another level that says it never fails. No matter, even though you think it failed, that's just your own movie and limited way of thinking because if the creator is looking at it, the creator is not pointing to your relationship saying oh you failed because there's a continuum from the creator's point of view the, it's like ways ways doesn't get upset with you and say you, you're an idiot if you make a wrong turn right ways doesn't say oh you failed or whatever gps you or whatever use. gps it just recalculates you it recalculates and it just gives you from its point of view you know you're just going on your path so I think that's just really powerful. Well, to important. the point to to the point we're trying to make with this whole episode about creating, I definitely did not envision for myself that you would get divorced. That I would get divorced, or that I don't think anybody. Maybe I'm wrong, but most people don't stand at the wedding ceremony and expect it to end. That's right. So <laughs> part of the, I would say, my journey as a creator in creating my own reality is has been and continues to be constantly changing my perception of what's best for me. Is there anything you wish you did differently in those eight years? Um, <laughs> I, Six minutes, so I want to know. <laughs> Listeners want to know. I, I think that if there, if there is such a thing as regret or if there was a part of it I wish I could have done differently, it, it is more connected to myself as an individual and as a parent. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. You had, two, you had, two, you had three kids. I have three kids that now they're in their 20s. And now that I have another batch of kids. <laughs> another batch. I mean, granted, with time, we all become more enlightened. But yeah. I, I do see, I, I see that I parented my first harvest as though they were, we were living in the 60s, basically. Oh, I was a really tough mom. Oh, you were a tough mom. I was a very tough mom. Wow. And I guess they, you know, we teach in Kabbalah that kids choose their parents and those kids knew not only that they, they were, knew what they were getting into, they knew what they were getting into and they needed it for whatever reason. Right. And they also knew that they were coming to parents who'd get divorced. Mm. So you, so, okay, this is really, oh gosh, I mean, we, this has got to bleed into the next episode. That's my, my opinion. Cause I got a lot more questions, but, but you <laughs> we'll say, do two, two topics every episode, the actual topic and, <laughs> and then, digging into my personal then, life. <laughs> Cause I think there's so many gems there. So, so you, so you say you were a tough mom and but that's obviously no regrets there going into they they actually like i my one of my older kids said like 
why do you let the kids put their elbows on the table? You didn't let us put our elbows uh, on the table. Oh, I see. So you were much more strict with them. I and- was very, and and I I did think I was doing the right thing. It wasn't malicious and it wasn't from a place of anger. I wanted my kids to be well-behaved. I wanted them to be respectful. Yep. And they are well-behaved and respectful. Right. They are, once I had a, a met, met somebody who I hadn't seen in a long time and he told me, you know, I saw your son on the street and he stopped and he, he said hi respectful. to me. And he shook my hand and he made eye contact. And he said, you know, young people these days, most mm. of them probably would have looked at the ground and walked past, you know, it's their true. parents' friend from a long time ago. But he really stopped and had a conversation It's true. With I me. can attest to that. Your kids are like that. That's, you're the first batch. So my, my point is that as I evolved, I, I wished that I had parented more compassionately and more empathetically. Um, and I try to do that now. And... That's one of my one of my realizations, both for myself and them, is that I wasn't very compassionate to myself or them at in, the time. At the time, in mm. those eight years, I was very tough on myself. Mm. And I ask myself, I look back and I say, what, what, what was I thinking? Why did I do that even? But it was so, as David said, it was so ingrained in us to push through the difficult emotions and and really use. Kabbalistic tools, spiritual approaches to things and not go to, not wallow, not not be too much in what's going on with me, but really be there for others. And that was healing and that did heal. But I feel we're in a different time now. I, well, I think what's so powerful about this and how it also does relate to this week's energy is we just talked about two different lifetimes, right, for you. Maybe even three if you count before the marriage. But you just walked us through two lifetimes of marriage, two lifetimes of having different sets of children, how you parent, and the amount of years you had to go through to learn those lessons. And one of the things that I always share is I, I do believe there is some level of a shortcut that you can take to grow your soul and learn those lessons merely by connecting to someone else's process, learning from them, uniting yourself with them. So I think the very fact that you shared this uh, has not only taught us all something that we probably don't have to go through, at least don't have to go through in the same same intensity. And I think that's also how we can create new lives for ourselves without the pain and suffering. Because ultimately, every single thing that happens to us is to elevate our consciousness and elevate our certainty, to a high level of certainty. But we can still extract those lessons vicariously through other people. If we listen to them, we connect with them, and we internalize what they're saying. Right, that's throughout the, the the history of Kabbalah. Basically, every Kabbalist was essentially a storyteller, mm. right? That it's much more powerful to that's learn right. a lesson. You know, you can tell somebody one plus one is two, but it's going to be more powerful if you give them a, an experience of that, how that applies or worked for someone else. That's right. I mean, I always tell this to people. Like today, I have a I have a lunch. I try to set up. At least one, at least like five a week, where I get to meet people who I um, nothing to do with Kabbalah even, but something they do very well. I want to meet with them and just can and learn how they did it, why they did it, what they had to go through to get it. Because I know that that forty five minutes I sit with them, I'm learning enough that's going to save me years of pain, suffering, to just kind of break a limited belief system and something I keep pounding my fist on the table, encouraging everybody to do. You got to get out of your house. You got to get out of your office. You got to get out of your routine. Take people to coffee. Take people to lunch. Add value to them, but learn from them. And that, that is, by successful people want nothing more to do than to mentor. So if you want to know how you add value to someone who's achieved something, is learn from them and be a good student. That makes, fulfills them like crazy, more than if they closed the deal and made a ton of money. So get out of what are you, whatever you're doing. Like today, just forget about the routine of oh, I got to do this, I got to do that, and my chores, my this, my, my business. Maybe. Meet someone who does something better than you and ask them a gajillion questions the way I asked Elisheva because Elisheva has ample amount of experience more than me in both marriage and raising children. So I'm using this 20 minutes selfishly <laughs> to extract as many secrets as possible so that selfishly I don't have to go through that. And that was my takeaway was you achieve greater results through through uh, through compassion than through than through being uh, uh, what I don't want to say schooled. Sco- okay, schooled. I like that. And I and I was funny. Disciplined. I, it was it, I was a good disciplinary, not not 
didn't use my hands, used only my words, but I was, I, I held high standards for my kids and they met them. They meet, they continue to meet them, but I don't give it, if we could have a full on redo mm -hmm. with the same kids. You do it the same way. I don't, Maybe know. Them, yeah. I don't know. I, I mean. Maybe they wouldn't have chosen you then. If you're going to redo it, they're going to like, well, sorry, mom, I'm going to go to another <laughs> parent that's strict <laughs> And is going to end up in divorce because that's what my soul needs. So great that you elevated your consciousness, I but wanna, now I need to bypass you. I want to end with one thought, if it's okay with you, because I know you want it no, to end. No, end it. Yeah, you got to end it. So I got an email from someone a number of years ago mm -hmm. who said to me, who asked me, what are the five things that make you a great parent? Mm. And what was my mm. response? Who said I'm a great parent? Mm. <laughs> I wish you didn't give that response. You just said the five things, but okay. Well, we can have that. We can have another episode about five five tips for being a great parent. Yes. But to me, it's very much about this week's energy. Is that what makes you great at anything that you do, and what allows you to truly be the creator of your reality, is actually your ability to pivot. Mm. So. Even looking at kids, and I know some of the people who are listening don't have kids. Some of you have grandkids or great grandkids. We're all on different stages. Some of you won't even, it's, it's a totally mm. irrelevant conversation to talk about kids. But the, le the underlying point is universal. And that is the best you can be of whatever role or whatever title you give yourself is if you are not attached to the results as a measurement of your performance. Mm. So, you know, even saying, oh, you have great kids. My kids are also a work in progress. You know, I'm a great kid. Ask my parents, I am a great kid. Mm -hmm. I am not a finished product. And the, the amount of pride or, um, uh, what's another word for pride? It's like the, if you're invested in something and it defines who you are, it's not, you're not that good at it. <laughs> Meaning you're looking at your, the outcome to define who you are and it's really about the process. If you can be unconditional and pivot and look at every moment and say, okay, we're here now, where are we going next? Or yeah, does everybody feel loved? Is everybody clothed and fed and educated and, and being guided in the right way? Absolutely. But there's always something else. There's there's a next for every single person. And our ability to pivot in what, what comes to us next is really more important than what we just accomplished. And and I feel that as a parent, you know, we can say, okay, they got good grades. Is that is that a measurement? Is there they have a successful job? Is that a measurement? They found a good partner? Is it's not because everybody is a constantly moving and evolving entity. <laughs> And to use a snapshot of anybody's process to indicate success or failure, going back to that failure idea, it's useless, it doesn't help anybody, and it actually can be uh, um, misguiding. If you look and you say, okay, I'm done here. My kid graduated college, they have a good job, I'm done here. You're wrong. And it's not true. And you're not a success. your greatest success is not the fact that your kid got into college, finished college, or got a great job. It's not about you. And how you create your next moment, your next project, your next level is only about what you're doing right now. Things happened in the past, great. Focus on the basket in front of you. How can you add value and fill it up right now? The Weekly Energy Boost is available on all podcast platforms, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram. You can follow us on all social media platforms as well. We have a website, weeklyenergyboost.com, where you can not only go find our archives and things we think are important and we, that we want to share with our listeners, but also you can now support us. We have a donate page where if, you, if you've been enjoying what we produce, what we put out there, the wisdom and the tools, you can help make our show possible by contributing via our donate page. And of course, liking, rating, reviewing, and sharing is really the best gift you can give us. We're, we're excited to be reaching more listeners every week and look forward to continuing to well into the future. Have a fabulous week, and we'll see you next time on the Weekly Energy Boost. Mm -hmm.